um, I'm Amelia, I'm a fourth year um, and I really like psychology so um, I'll try my best to like work through this topic with you guys and if you do have any questions like please don't hesitate to ask um, and of course there'll be time for questions at the end um, and Rosie's going to post a feedback link in the chat at the end so you guys can fill that out and get the slides. Perfect. Um, next slide please. Um, next slide, look, Rosie, please. Sorry, can you not see the next, next slide? I'm on slide oh, three now. Can't. <laughs> oh, technology. Um, that's fine. I can just work for it. If I just, if you just, whenever I don't need to see the slides, so um, as long as everyone else can. Can everyone else see communication at the moment? Oh, amazing. Thank you, Natasha. OK, um, so I'm going to split the lecture up in two parts, the first part being communication and the second part being learning and conditioning. Um, and then we can go through some MCQs together. And then if there's time, I've got a couple essay questions I thought we could maybe um, just discuss together as a group, just because I think the essay questions are really interesting if you, especially in group work, if you work together and work out what's the best way to structure it. It makes it easier on the exam day to help your thinking process because you've done it before. OK, um, so after condition. Yeah, next slide, Rosie. Um, so I think it's really interesting with communication um, and learning conditioning to make sure that you know all the key terms. Um, so essentially I've just. Um, the descriptions of them, all of them are here, but the key terms I think are really interesting for communication are phonology, which is the sound of words, semantics, the meaning of a word or phrase, and that's split up into logical semantics, which is concerned with sense, implication and reference, and lexical semantics, which is arguably the more important one, uh, which is concerned with the analysis of word meanings and their relationships. Um, and then, of course, there's grammar, which is a combinatorial set of rules, essentially syntax, in order to create and generate information and discourse, a unit of language longer than a single sentence. And if you know these key terms, whenever you come across anything to do with language, you should it should be really easy to understand. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we'll find what language is. Um, so essentially, language is a system that consists of the development, acquisition, maintenance and use of complex communication symptom systems. And it's a system of shared symbols and procedures. Um, and it's important to know that this is not necessarily audio vocal, but it also includes reading and writing or even sign language. Um, so language is important for the communication of information and relies on language actually relies on several forms of information um, to be communicated. And that includes phonology, the sound of words, semantics, the meaning of words and syntax, which is grammar. And grammar is actually particularly interesting to note because it's the hierarchical structure of language because it, it allows language to be creative and generative, which is something that animals don't have. So although animals can communicate with each other, for example, like the waggle dance of bees, um, which indicates where good nectar is, it doesn't allow bees to be creative or, or generative with their language. Um, and that's essentially why there's no animal models of language. So the only way that you can really study language is via people. Um, and of course, that's not saying you can't study language in animals. It's just not the same. So monkey calls could be considered symbols or words, for example, um, and monkeys can learn to sign, but there's no evidence that there's application of rules in this communication. Um, that there's no creativity. Um, monkeys can only sign like two words as an average sentence length. Um, so it's more imitative rather than productive, um, which is not how humans learn to produce language. Um, and when you look at the studies of babies and infants and children, they can't help but learn grammar, whereas it's the opposite for, lang for animals. They can't learn grammar. Um, and interestingly, language structure and grammar is, is best acquired at a young age, um, which suggests that there's a critical period, which is the maturational time period during which some crucial experience will have its peak effect on development or learning, resulting in normal behaviour. And there's a really nice case study of this, um, of this girl called Jeannie. And Jeannie was confined to a room from the age of two and punished for making sounds. 
um, she wasn't spoken to um, until the age of 13 and a half when she was fostered into a normal linguistic environment, quite controversially by the people that also studied her. But that's more of an ethical argument than today's lecture. Um, but Jeannie is an interesting case because she did acquire some vocabulary, but this wasn't normal and there was no normal phonology, so no sounds of words. She, she, she found it difficult um, to also create syntax and morpholo morphology in her language. Um, so that suggests that there is a critical period for language development and to acquire language. Um, although there is an interesting point that she did use language to refer to things in her past, even though she had no language capability at the time, which does beg the question, and there's no right answer to this, it's just something for you guys to think about as to whether language is necessary for thought or not, because if Jeannie could refer to things in her past when she didn't have language, when she acquired it, how, was she, how did she think? How did that work? But there's also some interesting um, other examples of how language is structure is best acquired at a young age, and that includes uh, the acquisition of second languages. So essentially, the earlier exposure to a language, the greater your fluency will be. And although adults outperform children in the early stages of language acqu acquisition, this effect is temporary. So there's a really nice study by Johnson and Newport in 1989, where they studied the comprehension of English grammar in Chinese and Korean immigrants to the USA. And they controlled for years of exposure to this. And essentially, they, they came to the conclusion that the earlier you arrive up to the age of 16, there's a linear increase in the grammatical performance of people that arrive earlier, whereas after the age of 17, there's no correlation between grammar and new language acquisition. And that doesn't only apply to vocal language. There's also been studies on the acquisition of sign language, where deaf children born to hearing parents are often not exposed to sign language to the age of five. And these children seem to do worse compared to deaf children born or deaf children exposed to signing from an early age. So there, there's evidence that deaf infants will babble with their hands and show an insensitive for signing. And if they're taught sign language straight away, um, this makes the acquisition of sign language a lot easier um, compared to late learners or adults who have particularly difficulty with grammar and learning signs. Um, yeah, so language is really interesting. And if we move to the next slide, we can talk about language comprehension and production. So essentially, language comprehension is the perception of spoken or written language by analysis of discourse, syntactic and lexical representations, whereas language production is the formulation of a message by utilising discourse, planning, lexical selection and syntactic encoding. So essentially, they're inherently linked um, and there's the requirements for comprehension and production of words and sentences are the same. So you need to have existing knowledge of the language structure you need to have knowledge of the current situation and you also need to have the cognitive ability to be able to produce language and comprehend it. So that includes having memory and the attention to be able to listen and keep that information in your mind and then the motor control, whether that be signing or speaking, to be able to communicate that back and produce language. Um, and studies have shown that listeners actually encode specific attributes about a talker's voice and speaking rate into long term memory. So it's not just linguistic information. When you listen to someone speak um, and you comprehend what they're saying, you also unknowingly get information about their gender, their dialect, the speaking rate and their emotional state. And all of that in one context influences the perception and the retention of spoken words. So essentially language comprehension and production um, encompasses linguistic and lung linguistic information and all of that as a whole enables you to correctly respond to somebody and comprehend what they're saying. Um, next slide. Which leads us nicely to how language is localised in the brain. So although both hemispheres do play a role in every behaviour, there is a relative relationship that there is naturalisation of function um, of the left hemisphere being particularly specialised for phonology and syntax, whereas the right hemisphere has access to semantics, but lexicon is disorganised. And this has been demonstrated really nicely by split brain patients. Where their corpus callosums have been cut um, in order to treat severe epilepsy, 
So essentially, by cutting the corpus callosum, you can you then have a model or a patient to be able to study the activity of either hemisphere independently. So if you flash an image or a, a photo of something on the patient's right hand side, this will only be seen by their left hemisphere. And if you vice versa, flash it on their left hand side, this will only be seen on their right hemisphere. So if you sew an object in a patient's right visual field, um, which is seen on their left hemisphere, a patient can say what it is and report the image in word normally. So the left hemisphere is specialised for phonology and syntax. Whereas if you show an object in a patient's left hand field, um, which is seen in their right hemisphere, patients report nothing seen, but they can correct an correctly select an object from a list or draw it. So essentially that shows that the right hemisphere has access to the meaning of words, but the lexicon is disorganised and thus the left is needed for speech production. Um, and then obviously when we're talking about language lateralisation, you also need to talk about Broca's area and Wernick's area, which I'm sure is not new to you guys at all, but is, is really important in any, any essay or uh, anything to do with the localization of language and essentially Broca's area um, these are two areas in the left hemisphere that are important for language so Broca's area is areas 45 and 44 and it's in the frontal lobe and it enables speech production whereas Wernick's area is area 22 and it's vital in the comprehension of written and spoken language um, and it's found in the superior lobe temporal lobe in the dominant hemisphere so um, yeah, we'll move on to the next slide and we'll talk about the aphasias of these um, areas, what happens when you lesion them later on when we talk about disorders and pathology. So part of your syllabus talks about speaking and reading, which I think is really interesting because all reading depends on a written system, but phonology, so spoken word, plays a critical role in recognising words. So it's believed that speaking and reading have a reciprocal relationship. And although while speech is found in all human civilization, reading and writing are less widespread. So it seems plausible that readers use their knowledge of spoken language to comprehend written text. And young children have been shown to use like oral language skills to learn how to read. And in, indeed, there are two routes to reading, which is either reading by sight or by sound. So there's a really interesting study by Barron in 1973 where readers were found to have much more trouble reading sentences such as he doesn't like to eat meat with meat being spelled m e m w e t um rather than it being spelled as you would say it m e a t um and readers reading that sentence found it more difficult um to be able to differentiate between meat with two e's and meat with e a um but when they did this again with people that were born deaf and lacked full command of spoken language, the, these deaf patients didn't show a difference between being able to differentiate between the two types and they were they were absolutely fine being able to differentiate meat and meat, suggesting that spoken language has a huge um, impact on, on written language. Um, and if you look at dyslexics, which we'll talk about um, later, but essentially there's different types of dyslexics and um, with dyslexia you have trouble depending on the type of dyslexia you have you have troubles with either reading by sight or sound so surface dyslexics use letter sound correspondence to read words and non-words whereas phonological dyslexics rely on sight vocab and cannot convert letter to sound and deep dyslexics have problems with both sight and sound reading so this really nicely demonstrates the relationship between speaking and reading and how they are inherently linked. So considering all of this and language, there must be some genes involved, some familial inheritance going on. Um, and there was a really nice study in 2002, which followed the KE family, which were 15 family members affected with speech and language difficulties. Um, and these these family members showed evidence of impairment of expressive language, receptive language and nonverbal IQ. And when they did PET scans in these patients um, and these affected family members, um, investigations showed a structural and a functional abnormality of the chordate nucleus, essentially showing that the chordate is important in controlling movement sequences. So in line with their speech production difficulties. So as this is a genetic order, 
disorder from birth, it was more likely to affect myelination and neural number, and hence the differences in the chordate nucleus could occur. Um, and then another case of CS was a, an individual identified with a similar phenotype to the KE family, and this enabled identification of the gene that was involved in both case CS and the KE family. And essentially, that is FOXP2. And you guys have probably heard of Fox, the FOX genes in different lectures, such as your pathology lectures. Um, but interestingly, in language, um, it seems to have a role in language learning disorders, um, although its complete role and how this functions hasn't been fully elucidated yet. It's interesting this Fox P2 mutation had such a wide impact on both the KE family and patient CES. Um, yeah, so we'll move on to the next slide, um, which kind of sums it up really nicely to language disorders. So whenever you have any essay question about communication in psychology, it's always really important to emphasize your point by saying by relating to how structure relates to function and what happens when that that fails um so if you've got a lesion and if you've got a lesion in Broca's area you have impaired speech production but relatively normal comprehension um so these patients will have slow labored and telegraphic speech um and interestingly they also have problems with sight syntax and comprehension and this is called repetitive agrammatism. Um, so that manifests for like reversible sentences, such as the boy kissed the girl and the boy was kissed by the girl. And for somebody without Broca's aphasia, that's fine. We know that they're reversible and we know that they mean the same thing. However, um, if the sentence structure is not in the way, in the standard structure that a patient would normally expect, in patients with Broca's aphasia, they can't comprehend when the sentence structure is switched around. So although comprehension is relatively good, there are difficulties encountered if the sentences don't follow the standard structure, uh, which is an important point to note because normally it's a misconception that patients have completely normal comprehension in Broca's aphasia when it's just relatively normal. And then of course there's Wernicke's aphasia where severely impaired comprehension, um, but patients have normal articulation. So repetition in these patients is poor, although the speech is grammatical and well formed, it is often devoid and empty of content. And then, of course, there's also developmental language disorders where children struggle to learn their native language with no obvious cause. And this seems to be a multiple gene disorder. Um, it was previously known as a specific language impairment. Um, and it's quite common, actually, with approximately 7% of like preschool nursery children showing evidence of this disorder um, and there's a study by Mays, Rayleigh and Morgan in 2014 which was a systematic review where they showed that abnormalities in the structure and function observed in the left inferior frontal gyrus and left superior temporal gyrus um, resulted in differences in the dorsal striatum which may may be one cause for the developmental language disorders of, of these children but by far the most common language disorder is dyslexia, um, which is a specific learning disorder characterised by difficulties reading or spelling. That's not explained by intellectual disability, economic or environmental disadvantage or visual motor problems. And there also seems to be a, a marked familial risk in dyslexia too, which is interesting. Lots of language disorders, unless they're acquired, seem to have a, a familial risk or an environment, uh, a genetic inheritance factor. Um, but essentially dyslexic patients find difficulties with phonology and they're unable to read none words. Their letter sound knowledge is poor. Um, but if you train these children from an earlier age, so it's important to pick it up if patients are showing evidence of dyslexia, you can train children with phonological awareness and letter sound correspondence training and that can improve reading and comprehension in these children. Um, so essentially with dyslexia and language impairment there are two main theories about the cause of dis developmental dyslexia and it's thought there may be a deficit in phonological 
awareness whereby children are unable to split language into competent sounds for correspondence with written language. Or it may be in other cases of developmental dyslexia, it thought that there might be an underlying visual or auditory deficit in the magnocellular pathway. But that's something interesting to debate um, and you guys can look that up. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we move on to learning conditioning, which I think is the more interesting part of this lecture, to be honest. Um, if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask or type them in the chat if you don't want to um, write on your uh, open your mic. Um, yeah, so learning and conditioning. Um, so same thing again, if you learn the key terms, it makes it easier to understand all of the pathologies and all of the experiments later. So the key terms to learn would be learning, which is a change in behaviour that results from practice, conditioning, a behavioural process whereby a response changes frequency dependent on the context as a result of reinforcement. And with this, with conditioning, there are some acronyms that you should definitely learn, which is the UR, which is the unconditioned response, the CR, the conditioned response, the US, unconditioned stimulus, and the CES, the conditioned stimulus. And essentially, any like so any changes in the, how the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus are presented will result in changes in the unconditioned response or the conditioned response. And essentially, whatever you change in those four will result in a different outcome. So habituation is a decrease in the responsiveness following repeated stimulation and sensitization is an increase in the responsiveness with repeated stimulation. And then obviously if you're having conditioning occur, extinction is really important to know because it's a recovery of behaviour after you remo remove the relationship that you've induced. Move on to the next slide. Um, so that moves us nicely on to the first form of conditioning in the syllabus, which is classical conditioning, also known as Pavlovian conditioning. Um, and essentially it's defined by the experimental procedure that results in the change, i.e. we don't observe the conditioning as a procedure that we perform. So it's a form of associative learning whereby a previously neutral stimulus becomes associated with another stimulus for repeated pairing with that stimulus. So to put it succinctly, on repetition of the conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus, the conditioned stimulus will eventually elicit the conditioned response in absence of the unconditioned stimulus, which I know is a mouthful, but if you learn how to say it really succinctly, it will make your essays a lot easier to write. Um, so classical conditioning essentially relies on the conditioned stimulus being prepared with the unconditioned stimulus, but that procedure involves a contingency. So there must be a high contingency between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. But we'll talk about the constraints of learning in, a, in the next slide. Um, and we'll just mention Pavlov's dogs is the, like, the classic example of classic conditioning, um, which you should definitely know. Um, so essentially, Pavlov won the Nobel Prize in 1904 for his studies in dogs, where he studied the digestive tract by monitoring the saliva and gastric juice output of dogs when, when they were given meat powder. So initially, he would give dogs meat powder which is the unconditioned stimulus and monitor their physiological response which is the unconditioned response of salivation and after a short time he found that the dogs would present the same responses prior to be giving food and that salivation would be triggered in the presence of the technician who normally fed them so that would be the conditioned response um, and further testing then showed that by presenting a stimulus for example, the sound of a metronome, so this is where the bell comes in, immediately prior to giving the dog's food the unconditioned stimulus. So you've got the conditioned stimulus, which is the bell, and the unconditioned stimulus, which is the food or the, the meat powder. Um, on repetition of this, just eventually just the, the sound of the metronome alone could cause salivary stimulation. And this is really interesting because you can relate that back to hum everyday human life because classical conditioning actually plays a, a huge role in your emotional reactions such as fear. Um, so for example, if a cat repeatedly scratched you as a child when you were young, cat, um, you'd have a negative association between the cat that scratched you, the conditioned stimulus, 
and being scratched, the unconditioned stimulus. So it's likely, so if this happened a lot, you'd eventually become fearful or even have a phobia of cats when you're older. And this is really interesting because if you think about all the things you're afraid of, your initial emotional reaction as a child to an event could could warrant and explain your fears when you were older. Um, so a, a gradual and increased exposure to cats, if I was afraid of cats, um, would actually reverse the association and cure your fear or phobia um, in its simplest, in the mo mo most basic manner. So for many years, the behaviourist view was at like dominant and classical conditioning. But then some researchers I argued that the critical factor behind conditioning is that the animal knows and there's like a cognitive view behind this. Um, so essentially an animal acquires new knowledge about the relationship between two stimuli, which is why it acts the way it does. And there are some there must be some cognitive factors which must be considered when looking at classical conditioning. So essentially you need to know why you're afraid or understand that there's a reason that you're afraid. So that takes us really nicely on to the constraints on learning. If we go to the next slide. So when you're thinking about classical conditioning, there are some critical factors that may be required for conditioning or learning to occur. Um, and this includes contiguity, contingency and overshadowing. Now, initially, Pavlov believed that continu temporal continu contiguity was the critical factor that allowed conditioning to occur. So essentially, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus must occur close together in time for an association to develop. However, this is this school of thought has kind of been overshadowed um, by the contingency theory, where essentially contingency is now thought to be the empirical determiner of learning. So although it was originally thought that just the pairing of the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus alone was thought to be sufficient to establish a conditioned response, it is now known that there is, must be a high contingency between the unconditioned stimulus and the unconditioned response. So essentially the conditioned response must be a reliable predictor of the unconditioned stimulus. And if the unconditioned stimulus were to occur in the absence, um, in the absence of the conditioned response, um, it would result in the extinction of that response, which is quite interesting. Um, and then if you, for example, which is actually quite interesting because um, if your unconditioned response occurs in the absence of the conditioned stimulus, and if this occurs frequently, it results in extinction. But you can have spontaneous recovery occur when the conditioned stimulus is represented after an interval uh, following extinction. And this response is greater after the extinction. Um, so it essentially suggests that you can never fully get rid of conditioning. Um, and indeed, there is actually a limit on the amount of conditioning that can occur in the pairing of two stimuli. And that's called the Rescola Wagner model. Um, my, um, my pronunciation is probably horrible, but um, I can type that in the chat if you guys didn't get that. Um, but essentially, this model suggests that there is a determinant on the limit of your stimuli, and that limit is dependent on the nature of the un. Um, sorry, let me repeat that. <laughs> um, so that the Rusikola Wagner model um, suggests that there is a limit between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus, and the limit on the nature of the unconditioned stimulus is what depends on conditioning that can occur. So for example, if you have if you pair a bell with a juicy steak, you're more likely to produce salivation than when pairing a bell with a dry piece of bread. And that dry piece of bread is likely to work better than a piece of cardboard. Which is interesting. So the key idea between the RW model is that the conditioned stimulus and conditioned signal stimulus signals or predicts the unconditioned stimulus. So it's all about pairing the right things together, because if you pair something. So if you, for example, if you did pair cardboard with a bell, you know, your your natural response is not to salivate towards cardboard. Um, and then the final constraint on learning is overshadowing, um, which essentially 
thinks about how it can influence other and Kamen's blocking effect is a really nice the association with stimulus and un impaired if the condition stimulus is presented with a second condition stimulus during the process um, and the the classical example of this was would be a mouse exposed to a light with food so if a mouse is exposed to light condition stimulus one um, together with food the unconditioned stimulus repeated during of that will cause the mice to salivate when the light comes on however if you then introduce a second a tone condition stimulus two when you present it with the light condition stimulus one and the unconditioned stimulus the subject will not or the mice will not salivate to the just the tone alone and this is essentially due to the condition stimulus two and unconditioned stimulus association being blocked due to the previous existence of a condition stimulus one and unconditioned stimulus association so essentially you can you can't really influence other learning events because there's a blocking effect that happens which takes us on to operant conditioning, which is the second key type of conditioning you guys should know. But essentially, the stim stimuli present when a behaviour is rewarded or punished can control that behaviour. So for example, a child may learn to open a box to get candy inside, or may learn to avoid touching a hot stove. And the box and stove are the dis discriminative stimuli between that. And this descriptive stimulus is consistently used to gain a specific, specific response that increases the probability that that desired result will occur. So operant conditioning all depends on the learned association between an animal's behaviour and a positive or negative consequence. The animal must elicit the response in order for the forcer or punish, punisher to be delivered. And this is all based on Thorndike's law of effect. which essentially states that responses followed by positive consequences are more likely to be performed in the future and vice versa responses followed by negative consequences are less likely to be performed in the future so if you have reinforcement of the desired behavior and punishment of the desired behavior in different um, if you vary the way that that is reinforced and punished you can influence an animal's behavior so positive reinforcement where positive pleasant stimulus that follows a desired behaviour increases the likelihood of that behaviour and if you contrast that to positive punishment where you get presentation of an unpleasant stimulus after an undesired behaviour occurs and that will decrease the likelihood of the undesired behaviour. And Thorndike studied this process um, by using cats placed in cages which had a door which could be opened by pressing a latch with a piece of fish just outside the cage so at the first, the cat would just try and reach the fish by putting its paws through the cage. And when that didn't work, the cat moved around the cage, engaging in a variety of behaviours. Eventually, the cat would inadvertently press the latch, which opens the door and allows the food to be reached, the fish. Um, but when placed back in the cage, the cat will go through roughly the same series of events, but over a series of trials. Um, but much of the irrelevant behaviour prior to opening the latch is reduced until the cat eventually opens the latch as soon as it puts in, as soon as it's put in the cage. So Thorndike explained this, that the cat is engaging in trial and error behaviour. And when a reward follows one of those behaviours, the learning, the actions is strengthened. And that's his law of effect. But I think the Skinner's box example is, is a lot easier to understand um, and easier to write about. So in 1984, um, Skinner placed a rat in a box and left the rat to explore and it measured the number of times that the rat pushes a lever that is in the box and that was taken as baseline level as your control and when um, eventually that box would be the cage would be turned on so when the rat pushed the lever um, it would release a pellet of food so the rat would initially accidentally push the lever and get a, a food pellet and then the rat would soon to learn run up to the lever as soon as it was placed in a box and the frequency of the lever pushing would increase dramatically in order to be rewarded with the food. Um, and that shows positive reinforcement. And then Skinner also shows that these rats can adapt to negative reinforcement because if you initiate an electric shock when a light came on um, and the lever stopped the shock, the rats would also learn that. 
so it's all about positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement but also positive punishment and negative punishment and if you look at the table on the slides this is a really good way to sum that up operant conditioning is essentially just positive reinforcement positive punishment negative reinforcement and negative punishment and how you vary your stimulus and your reward or reinforcement depends on what association is learned um, next slide and so learning how the, these conditioning both classical and operant conditioning works may help explain the progression to mental illnesses and this is all about maladaptive learned behavior so essentially there's a few different schools of thought and examples, but I've picked three that are interesting and easier for you guys to understand. Whereby, um, so the first example is learned helplessness, whereby there's no contingency between the behaviour and the events. Um, so essentially what you do makes no difference. Um, and you associate that behaviour has no effect on outcomes and may allow that belief to be carried on to a new context. And that's an interesting theory as to how depression develops. Um, and you can kind of explain this with a experiment done by Seligerman in 1972, where he restrained dogs and gave them unavoidable shocks. But with um, but some of these dogs could either stop the shock by pressing a lever and another group could could not stop the shocks and had no control over whether the shocks happened or not. And then he moved both these groups of dogs to an avoidance situation where all the dogs could escape the shock by jumping over the hurdle. And the dogs who initially had control over their shocks learned to escape, whereas the dogs who initially had no control remained passive and just received the shocks. So essentially, these dogs have learned that their behaviour has no effect on outcomes and just allow it to be carried to a new context. And this may occur in depression. Um, and this sort of behaviour and conditioning can also be seen in the development of phobias where um, which is the extreme or irrational fear or aversion in response to a specific class of stimuli and it's a type of anxiety disorder that interferes with daily life and it's really important to note that it's not a phobia unless it interferes with your daily physical activities otherwise it can't be defined as that so the dsm4 divides phobias into three main categories a simple phobia which is fear of a specific object including like animals or a situation like the darkness um, a social phobia which is an extreme insecurity in a social situation such as an exaggerated fear of embarrassing yourself um, people might think that they're they're blushing or have trembling hands or stutter which is often not based on reality and then also agoraphobia which is arguably the most interesting type of phobia because it's fear and avoidance of places in which escape may be difficult but this generalized fear of living at home is often um, linked with panic attacks um, so, the, so it normally develops as a result of a panic disorder um, so because the individual so if you have panic attacks you might remember that the place where the panic attack occurs and generalize those feelings of panic um, to that place and then avoid other places. So the avoidance behavior is reinforced by less panic attacks where panic attacks don't happen. And thus through operant and classical conditioning, your behavior is shaped into agoraphobia. Um, and further studies have shown that cognitive behavioral therapy um, can cure like up to 90% of phobias. And this shows that patients, this because it allows patients to understand the negative thought patterns and ways in which these can be changed and actually address their thought patterns towards how phobias and agoraphobia developed. Um, whereas if you use treatments based on um, drugs such as SSRIs or benzodiazepines, they tend to only relieve symptoms in the short term without actually addressing the underlying problem. So the systematic desensitization of, uh, of of phobias using cognitive behavioral therapy is actually a form of classical conditioning itself, which involves the teaching of relaxation skills to target the anxiety responses. And then these skills are then used to overcome the fear and progressive exposure to the fear. So, for example, touching, um, for example, progressing from like touching a picture of a spider to actually seeing it a spider to then touching the spider is all ways that you can then remove your phobia and help that um, help it get better 
Um, and the last interesting form of maladaptive learned behaviour is anticipatory nausea and vomiting, which is a learned behaviour to initial reaction like all things. But it's interesting because um, if you attend chemotherapy, um, which acts as the unconditioned stimulus, you can then get nausea. But subsequent trips would result in anticipatory nausea and vomiting despite like before you actually attend your subsequent chemotherapy sessions. And this only develops in people that have had at least one chemotherapy session. And the severity is related to the initial reaction to the drug. So essentially you could avoid, this is really interesting in clinical practice because if you, if people who are diagnosed with cancer then go for chemotherapy, they could then predispose themselves to anticipatory nausea and vomiting on their first session, depending on their initial reaction to the drug. However, you could avoid that by pre-exposing patients to the hospital or where they're going to go get their treatment before. So like a, a pre, and there's some trials going on right now with pre-exposure, um, so allowing patients to visit the hospital where their chemotherapy will happen before they go for chemotherapy in their first session. And if we go to the final slide, um, the important pathologies to do with conditioning are quite interesting and I don't think we'll have enough time to run through them all but I'll try and give you guys a broad rundown quickly but essentially it includes obsessive compulsive disorder where conditioning extends from a single association of a neutral and feared stimulus to a higher order conditioning to include more object situations and fears so initially this begins classical conditioning and then operant conditioning occurs later and it's the same school of thought with phobias and obsessive compulsive disorder that conditioning can be eliminated for extinction. And then schizophrenia, which is a whole lecture in itself, but essentially abnormalities in reinforcement learning in, um, are proposed to be linked to abnormalities in dopamine neurotransmission, which enables the development of schizophrenia. But there's a huge environmental and genetic relationship between schizophrenia which has still not been unraveled um, but depending on um, depending on how your treatment evolves you can have positive uh, your sorry your syndrome evolves you can have positive or negative symptoms with positive symptoms involving hallucinations delusions and disordered thought and negative symptoms involving lack of motivation, inappropriate emotion and an inability to care for oneself. And it's actually thought that depending on your biological and social factors can affect um, your can affect your symptoms and the severity of them. So it's often seen that individuals with more negative symptoms, such as lack of motivation, are, are more prone to relapse due to the unforgiving nature of family members towards those symptoms. Whereas if they are more understanding of uncontrollable positive symptoms, such as hallucination, you might get more negative symptoms. Um, which just leads us finally on to drug addiction, which again, you guys have a separate lecture on this in itself, but it's really interesting because um, classical drug addiction results from overactivation of the dopaminergic re reward pathway by positive and negative reinforcement. So psychoactive drugs such as cocaine, heroin and amphetamines have been shown to act via three mechanisms to make them so addictive. The first being um, causing overactivation of the reward systems in the brain, so the dopaminergic um, active systems. And the second being the fact that addictive drugs often cause unpleasant withdrawal symptoms as the body becomes tolerant to the drugs and more drug is required to get the same effect. So it's thought that the body produces compensatory responses to the drugs which are balanced when the drug is taken to produce tolerance. But when the drug is withdrawn, there are withdrawal symptoms because there is no counteracting drug. And then the third reason being addictive drugs may produce permanent changes in the brain reward symptoms systems so that neurons are hypersensitized and react more strongly to the drug. These long term changes may explain why there could be cravings for drugs even once detox programs have been completed. And how this relates to the conditioning is interesting because context has been shown to be key to drug tolerance and its maintenance. So Sigel in 1977 showed that context is key for tolerance using rats injected with morphine. 
when they injected rats with a placebo, they found that rats were hyperalgesic due to the conditioned expectation of morphine. And tolerance in this case was induced by the injection cue to the rats. But if the rats were then taken out of their original environment and given a dose of morphine to which they originally tolerated, the rats will overdose. And this explains why addicts can die when taking a dose that they have previously tolerated in a new environment. And although that was shown in animals, this was then shown by Sega in humans in 1986 because a man with pancreatic cancer that had developed morphine tolerance was on the maximum dose. And then the man decided to leave his bedroom and move to the lounge after a prolonged time spent in the bedroom. And after a scheduled morphine dose in the news environment, he just appeared overdose and died a few hours later. And the hypothesis behind this is that the stimuli in the back in the bedroom acted as the conditioned stimulus, producing the conditioned response of morphine tolerance. And by removing that context and removing that conditioned stimulus, the morphine tolerance goes down. So this is why conditioning is really important in pain management it has a huge clinical importance because often doses increase to maximum levels to contain chronic pain. And once this, is max, this maximum dose is reached, there's nothing more can, that we can done. However, if a person's context has changed, their responses may increase and the dose required may decrease. And that's really interesting thought to consider. Um, yeah, so that leads us on to the MCQs. Um, I've got five for you guys. So I haven't set up Socrative or anything, but I thought you guys could either like raise your hand, shout it out, or write in the chat the answers, and then we can discuss why they're right or wrong. Um, so question number one. So next slide um, is essentially which of the following best describes classical Pavlovian conditioning? A process by which previously neutral stimuli become associated with an unconditioned stimulus that produces an unconditioned response. B, a learning process by which an intuitively understood conditioned stimulus becomes associated with the unfamiliar stimulus to produce a conditioned response. C, a learning process by which a previously neutral activity becomes associated with a reinforcer or punishment motivating the subject to pursue or avoid that activity. And D, a learning process by which a previously non-neutral stimulus becomes associated with the conditioned stimulus that produces an unconditioned response. So if you guys type away, decide what's the right one, we can move on. Got a few A's going on. There's just a few more people typing, so we'll let them finish. Okay, so if we move on to the next slide, the answer is A. Um, does anyone want to tell me why? It's all right if you guys don't want to, but um, tell me why A is the right answer. Um, I thought it was just because you start off with something that you don't have a response to that's kind of neutral. So, for example, the bell was a neutral stimulus and then you pair it to something that was that had an unconditioned stimulus that had the unconditioned response. So that would be like the food with salivation and then the neutral st stimulus became paired with the conditioned response in that case. Exactly. That's perfect. Couldn't have put that better myself. Um, yeah, so should we move on to the next question then? Um, question two, which of the following best describes operant conditioning? A, a learning process by which delivery of a reinforcer or punishment associated with activity teaches the subject to pursue or avoid that activity. B, a learning process by which an unconditioned stimulus is inconsistently, uh, sorry, is consistently linked to a conditioned stimulus to produce an unconditioned response. C, a learning process by which the individual is verbally taught, conditioned to avoid the to avoid or approach an activity and these lessons are incorporated or op op obturationalized operant or d a learning process generated after stimulation conditioning of neurons from an operationally inserted electrode operant amazing so yeah, the answer is A. Um, we'll go to the next slide. 
which is great. Um, does someone different want to say why the answer is the right one? That's all right. Um, I mean, it, it's pretty, um, pretty obvious just with operant conditioning, you've got a re the delivery of a reinforcer or punishment, um, which is associated with the, the, the operant. So how the animal acts to avoid or pursue the activity. So that's all based on like positive reinforcement or positive punishment, negative reinforcement or negative punishment. So if you guys learn that table, any questions you have will be absolutely fine on that. And the last question, uh, sorry, the third question, which is the following example of classical conditioning. Um, so it's really in make sure the although you understand it, it's also good to be able to put it to context. So a a subject becomes used to seeing internet models, develops tolerance and thus seeks a greater number and higher intensity of pictures. B, the clicking of an arrow on a screen causes the appearance of more models on screen, thus causing the subject to click more. C, a subject is informed of the psychological harm that internet models may cause him and so he avoids them. And D, a model associated with an accessory, for example, sunglasses or shoes, then causes the development of an arousal response to the accessor. Yeah, perfect is D. If we move to the next slide. And that's essentially just a contextual example of classical conditioning. So a learning process by which previous neutral stimuli becomes associated with the unconditioned response. Um, and that's based on a study that was done with university students. You guys can look that up. So the ultimate question, um, question four, semantic dementia is characterised by A, a poor memory for events, B, loss of word meanings, C, sp poor spatial ability, D, repeating the same sentences and E, slow speech. So if you just think about the definition of semantic and you guys will be fine. Yeah, perfect, B. Um, so yeah, the definition of semantic is uh, the vocabulary and the meanings of words. So semantic dementia, you guys know what dementia is, put two and two together, essentially the loss of word meanings, which leads us really nicely onto our last question, which are phobias and what they are. So phobias are a type of mood disorder, are mostly innate, are resistant to drug treatment, understood as enhanced dopamine transmission, or usually reduced by informing patients of their phobia. Yeah, perfect. It's C. Um, and that essentially relates back to how uh, CBT can treat phobias, but phobias have been shown to be resistant to drug treatment, and that relates to how phobias are conditioned and how they develop. So that's all I have for you guys. Um,